we've glorified the status of what it is to be a unicorn. And it's, of course, one milestone for any company being valued at a billion dollars, pounds, euro. But we've really glorified that status. And I think that's an unfortunate event. Um, and in doing in glorifying it, of course, everybody strives to become that. Um, and, and, and that may or may not be interesting, but, but in, in glorifying it, I think we, we make it the desire that everybody shoots for. And, and I think, you know, unfortunately, the status of unicorn um, doesn't last forever. And so it feels to me a little bit, uh, to use perhaps a, a sports analogy, is you qualify your team for the FA Cup final, um, and you're celebrating before you actually play the final. And I feel that this, unfortunately, what's happened with, 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 with unicorns is we're celebrating this list that's getting bigger and bigger every year. Um, and unfortunately, you know, they haven't played the final yet. The final, in my mind, is either, you know, you get sold or bought by somebody or you take your company public, ultimately. But so the status of unicorn, I think, is just a step. And sadly, we've, we've glorified it, in my opinion, at least to excess. Yeah, glorified to excess because the business world does seem to be obsessed with unicorn companies, doesn't it? Well, of course, you know, as investors, our single purpose uh, of existence is to make money on behalf of our own investors. And, and that unicorn status allows us to demonstrate to them that, hey, we're, we're heading in the right direction. Um, of course, the press also likes to talk about it because it glorifies individuals uh, that you know, they've achieved something that's interesting. And so there's, I think we've all gotten together and, and made this happen. And I think at the beginning it was interesting when it was new. Now it's, I think, becoming excessive. And as I said, it's a bit like playing the FA Cup final and, and celebrating <laughs> well, where we actually win. It, that, that must be a good thing, though, celebrating success. We, we, we love nothing more than that for as long as it doesn't become the single point of success celebration. Right. Um, as I said, the, the unicorn status comes, it goes. Many companies have had it, have lost it, have never gotten it back. Um, you know, if you look at many of the ones that are currently in that unicorn list that you have, many will likely never ultimately be sold for anything near that or will likely not go public. And so, you know, you also have a lot of disappointment that comes post that if you're not able to maintain that. You know, who remembers the losing team in any FA Cup final? Nobody, right? And so it's fine to celebrate, and I'm the biggest proponent of celebration. But celebrating milestones are key, uh, as opposed to this particular one event as the single event that's, that, that defines success. It doesn't, right? It's an element of what you're trying to do. I, I saw uh, what I thought was an incredible statistic the other day, that despite COVID, uh, more than 75% uh, of all current unicorns have joined the club since 2019. What, what do you put that down to? Well, I think it's, it's quite, quite simple, right? Um, Public markets exploded between 19 and 21. Um, and we use public markets and technology as a proxy for our own non-public companies. And so as the public markets went up, you know, valuations naturally followed in the private markets. Um, and so it's not unsurprising that so many were created when we've had essentially the biggest, you know, boom public markets in, in a long, long time. So, of course, the public markets are now down significantly, and we're going to see some of that negativity hit our companies, including many of the unicorns that are on that list. So, so you know, the, the, these companies also go through boom and bust periods as, as investors get more or less excited about the markets. Uh, we, of course, follow the public markets, and as a result of all of that, we get good periods and bad periods of unicorn births, right? 19 to 21 was a particularly fruitful period for us. Well, before that, in, in 2015, you rather famously said the majority of startups claiming to be worth over a billion dollars were, in fact, fakies. Yeah. What did you mean by that? Well, I, I mean that ultimately they will not be sold or taken public for anywhere near that, that, uh, that amount of money, right? And one has to always remember that uh, as we value, the way we value these companies in the, pub, in the private markets is you get one investor who comes in, says, hey, you know, I'm going to buy 5% of the company and then, or 10 maybe, and based on that, I'm going to value the rest of the company at that same price. And, and so, you know, it's a bit in the eyes of the beholder, so to speak, in sense of what they see in value today. 
Uh, ultimately, when you do have to graduate out of being a private company and you go public, you get a lot more scrutiny, a lot more people looking at what the price means. And so I think what I said in 2015 was really to say, hey, you know, we can celebrate unicorns. It's important, but many of them really just don't have the substance or the business to be ultimately very successful. I feel, by the way, the same way about the 2019-21 vintages. Is there going to be a lot of those companies who, you know, fundamentally don't have the business values, propositions, capabilities to sustain what it takes, I think, to be a long-term unicorn in the public markets. You were also quite cynical about fintech. And given that fintech made up, made up about 20% of unicorns, that, that's, that's, that, that is dismissive, isn't it? Yeah, well, look, I mean, of course, hindsight is, as we say, 2020. <laughs> uh, and we have to make predictions that probably wasn't one of my best ones. But I would say in my defense, if I felt I had to do that, is that if you look at it, um, I think I was really referring at the time to consumer facing fintech, i.e., you know, banks and things like that. And, and at the time, I felt like I would never give my money to a startup, right? I'd always go give it to Barclays or somebody else. It just felt like it was safer there. Um, most of the fintech success stories to date are companies that actually, what I what I would refer to as infrastructure companies who power how business is done. And they've been very successful. And, you know, funnily enough, uh, my latest unicorn is actually a London-based company, which is oh, in the really? financial service space. So, you know, ah. uh, you know fools, never ch fools need to change their opinions occasionally as well, right? Well, I'm sure you're not a fool. Far from it. Um, what sector do you think is best suited for unicorns, if there uh, yeah, is it, one? Yeah, well, I mean... The, I think the question is one of timing. When is the sector ready for disruption? Um, and so a lot of the work that we do at our firm is, is, is taking out a crystal ball and saying, you know, what's going to be hot or hip in 10 years? Right now, we think uh, healthcare is one of the great areas where there's big opportunities to disrupt the existing system, right? I mean, across Europe, <clears throat> we spend about 12% of our GDP on healthcare. Uh, in the U.S., it's 17 percent. Our population is not getting any younger. And so the only way we fundamentally change that is by applying technology to trying to solve some of these issues. Um, and so I think where we're spending most of our time is in that entire healthcare area. How can software, how can the Internet just make it easier, better, cheaper, right, for, 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 for people, for consumers, but also for prescribers, governments and things like that to operate. So that's for me, is one of the really, really great areas of opportunity. If I uh, read um, the details correctly, you look at about 2,000 potential startup deals every year and invest yeah. in about half a dozen. How do you yeah. pare it down? You said right at the beginning that some of it is luck. You don't take a pin, do you, in those 2,000? What do you look for? No. L l luck has to do with more the operating side of it than the environment. I think the choice side is, you know, we out of 2000, we'll make six investments and be wrong on half of those six, you know, so it is it is a tough it is a tough game. We, we have very definite, very defined processes, how we go about it. Each person in the firm will think about it in different ways. You know, I tend to be much more intuitive about it. I meet an entrepreneur. I don't like the idea. I walk away quite quickly. Some of my partners are much more engaged in looking at it. But, you know, the process ultimately is how you get from 2000 down to 500 in a rather quick way. Then how do you go from 500 down to 100 in, in a more, in a, in a, in a more, I would say, scientific method? And then you go from 100 down to five. And there's a lot of factors that play in there. The number one factor always in all these investments is, you know, what is the quality of the entrepreneur that you're going to back. Right. You're backing the human idea, the, 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 the man who's driving it. Correct. I mean, you know, the cemetery is full of great ideas, right? And, <laughs> and, and at the end of the day, it's all about the ability of a person or a team to take an idea and, and just drive it. Look, it's, it's a hard slug being an entrepreneur, right? Entrepreneurs are always blessed with self-belief or, or the successful ones, in, in my yeah. experience. But what yeah. about politics? Is there a risk there as well? Because governments around the world don't like tech firms getting too big now, do they? So <laughs> is that a problem? Well, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric out there. I, I spend very little of my time worrying about that rhetoric. I think that there's many more politicians who would love to see the, the, the startup community grow bigger um, or, or provide more jobs, uh, more opportunities. So I worry more about that side of the equation. And there we have an equal amount of very positive politicians around the world saying, you know, this is the path to growth. Right. Um, 
starters, it, believe growers, inventors. That matters more than anything else, I think. So are there parts of the world investors should be looking more at than other parts of the world? You know, I, I started my firm 20 years ago. I would have said to you that the U.S. was the unique place where really the action was happening. Uh, in 2022, I'd say, you know, the U.K. definitely has a super, super vibrant uh, ecosystem of, of great people doing great things. Uh, Israel is just rocking, of course. Um, startup nation, the name sticks stands for itself. Europe is beginning to see a number of pockets emerge. I, I think the internet has really democratized the ability to start and launch a company. So you can pretty much do it from anywhere um, and take on the world. So, so yeah, I think talent is the question, right? The, where does the talent come from? And, and there, you know, there's obviously more entrepreneurs in, in, in the US, now more in Europe. Um, but I think the world is your oyster if you're an entrepreneur. Southeast Asia is booming. You know, they have GDP growth of 7 to 8% per year. Um, their middle class is up and coming. So I'd be looking at some of those areas out there to, to, be, to, be, to, be, to, be, to be trying to do some stuff there. Mark, you know, lastly, you know there are many good companies out there. But what is the difference? What, what suddenly turns a good company into a great company? Well, I, I think, you know, are you able to truly find a fit that takes away any of the excuses to use the product and i think very often as companies go through these product development cycles you know there's always a little friction in using a product or buying a product or whatever and i think if you can really take that away you know skype my, my first big success was a very good example of that but but there's many many others out there you know people are using uh, netflix because it's just so easy to use from anywhere I think, you know, good to great is as much about product. But as I said, again, it's, it's really about individuals who are powering that company. And I, I, I would say that's really what makes it great is, is, is that they're so passionate about what they're doing that you look at it and go, wow, that thing. Yeah. And, then, and then last but not least is timing. You know, you could invest in certain sectors and unfortunately you're too early and the market just wasn't ready and, and you know that you need a bit of luck that's what i mean by luck right you're absolutely right it is a combination of all those factors isn't it um mark uh, thank you so much for joining us here on the agenda i'm most grateful thank you very much Stephen. all the best